to another episode of uh, Musician Stuck Music. All of you watching on YouTube, thanks for sharing it. If you want to look it up, you can just go to YouTube and search for Musician Stuck Music. Or if you're listening on a podcast, it's on all major podcast platforms. You can just search Musician Stuck Music and you'll see it uh, that way. Thank you again. So today I'm with uh, with a great guy, a great musician. His name is Fabian Chavez. Hey, hey. And uh, yeah, man, thank you for, for having me in your house. Hey, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming over. Yeah, he's a great sax player, a percussion player, he plays many other things, so we'll be talking a little bit about that. I'm just making Omar some coffee here. Shout out to Recreational Coffee, my cousin. He owns it in Long Beach, so if you ever want to go, let me know. <laughs> anyway. I know I've told you, you know, before about this project, and basically we just want to have like a really informal chat and conversation about about music, about your beginnings in music, and yeah. all the way to what you're doing right now and all that. So yeah, where were you born? Yeah, so I was born here in LA, or Downey specifically. Downey. Bellflower, I guess. Um, raised in Downey. I went to high school, middle, middle school, high school, elementary school, all that, and Downey. Uh, then I went to Cal State Northridge for college. When did you start like music? Like how, how old were you when you started like exploring music or, or how did it happen? Yeah, my dad is a bass player and oh. his family all plays. So my aunts, uncles, my cousins, my grandpa, my grandma, they had like a family band growing up. So my dad was always in like several bands and at church, They had like a band as well, so um, their their name was Grupo Cruz, Grupo and they were like Norteña, Norteño music, you know, um, and, and and like worship, you know. Nice. Um, so it was cool. So like there was always at my house, there was always like drum set set up, you know, bass, guitar, drums, like everything was always ready to go. The musical family. Musical family for sure. Was was sax your first instrument? Instrument no. or drums? Oh, drums. You started yeah. drums. I started playing drums, and my my dad always says kind of like I was born, you know, because there's like a video of me playing drums at three. I have it like on a video camera <laughs> and I'm like dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da. like straight up and singing in Spanish up, at the same time nice. I can't even speak Spanish anymore man. how <laughs> how old were you when you when you started like playing in music or drums I started playing when I was like really young but uh, I started playing like the first time I was like really playing in a group was at church okay I think I started playing in, like the youth ministry It, when I was like 11 or 10 maybe and when did you pick up the sax like or, or how how did it happen like, yeah I, w I wanted to play so like when I got into middle school that was like the first time they offered music as a band class you know so uh, I wanted to play drums but everybody wanted to play drums in that class so the teacher picked out of a hat uh, my teacher at Griffiths Middle School named really? Mrs. Mrs. Taylor yeah and I didn't get chosen you know she chose like four or five people and there was like 80 kids in the class And so like, I was super bummed and I went home and told my mom and she like even called the director. Oh, and I was wow. like, you know, my son plays, blah, blah, you know. And she's like, well, if he's playing drums already, he's gonna be bored out of his mind because we're just gonna start from like square one, nothing, you know. So she's like, I mean, have him keep playing drums and pick up another instrument, you know, is what I recommend, she said. So, um, my mom really liked Kenny G at the time, so I played saxophone. <laughs> man, a, a lot of moms have to thank Kenny G for, for inspiring their, their children. Cool, man. So, how, how old were you when you pick, picked up the sax? Twelve. Twelve, so like a year later from you started like playing youth yeah. ministry and all that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What do you think about it? Like, did you like it at first or...? I did, man. I remember like right when I, the first day I got my saxophone home, it was one of those things where like, I was already be able to make sound, like I was already playing like, you know, super basic songs, but I was just trying to like figure out melodies and like all the fingerings seemed like it came very natural to me, you know? So I was like, just first day I remember like, look, dad, look what I can play, you know? And I was playing like all this, like Mary Had a Little Lamb, Take a Little Star, and all of the like <laughs> cheesy ones, you know, the basic ones. But. So did your mom made you listen to Kenny G at that time? <laughs> well, I, I don't think she made me, oh, but okay. it was always on, you know? So but she liked, Other, like, I mean, coming from that, that's kind of like a good segue into like how I like got my sound is like, so from KG, I mean like they would always turn on like smooth jazz radio, you know, yeah. and like yeah. the wave, other people like Dave Cause and you know, Richard Elliott and Boney James, like all these smooth jazz guys. But then I found Gerald Albright, who someone I really, I mean, still to this day, I, I love his style, man. He's got a very like powerful attacking sound, super funky, very rhythmic, and he has a lot of bebop language, you know, which I can I, I come to love, you know, um, cool. that kind of playing in a contemporary setting like that. Even uh, even Kenny G, like I, I listened to a recording. Dude. He's playing uh, tenor sax, you know, his solo is like, That's nothing to do with smooth jazz. It's like 
throwing some nice lines in there. Oh, yeah. Man. There's always this one And the one sound, recording. like the quality of the sound is great too. Yeah. No, totally, totally. Yeah. Like, there's this one recording I always like like to um, reference when everybody's like, oh, blah, 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 talking smack about Kenny G. It's a Christmas song on a Christmas album. It's a uh, sleigh ride. That's a sleigh ride. And it's like, da, 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 but like his so like they go into this like rhythm changes like just straight ahead section. He destroys that. And he's like he's got lines and I'm like see like. Oh yeah, he can, he can play. He's just smart. Yeah. He's no, just he's, being he's smart with the business. <laughs> yep. Fast forward to your high school years and you kept you kept playing sax and. Yeah, like even so in high school it was so funny. Like I just told this story the other day. Um, I subbed in this ensemble called the Los Angeles Youth Jazz Ensemble. Okay. The first day I was there, John DeVerso was the one, he's teaching. And then they brought in a special guest, which was Ndugu Chancellor. It was held, it was an outreach program at USC on Sunday afternoons. So my parents would take me every Sunday, every Sunday. But yeah, my first time was in eighth grade and my friend Teresa was, um, I think she's the one who invited me to go to sub for the drummer in a jazz band. It was like ninth grade, yeah, going into ninth grade. So the first day I was there, you know, they had kind of told me like, you know, he's the drummer for Michael Jackson, he's on beat it, blah, blah, you know, they told all stuff, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, so I was so scared. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like sight reading this stuff, you know. And so like, there was this big band, I don't know what chart it was, or what, what. it was like, you know, right? So there's a little two bar rest. And so I remember I went, Order, right? and I did like a little fill in between and he stops, he's like, hold on, little drummer, what does it say right there? What does it say on bar five? And I'm like, uh, it's a, 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 a rest. It, and the next one, well, what's the next one? I said, there's two bars of rest. You know, and I was like so scared. And I was like, <laughs> well then play the rest. You gotta play the rest. What does it say there, drummer? And I'm like, oh. I was like so scared, but I remember like that was huge for me, you know, because it's like, all right, you know, you gotta respect the music, like, yeah, you know, yeah, and you know, if it says rest, you gotta rest, if it says fill, fill, but, but in that, so in that, in that ensemble, I played drums for all four years, like I did that literally from that time till I graduated. It was cool because, wait, what about sax? Were you like playing sax at all? Like, yeah, part of it was they gave you lessons, they gave you an hour lesson with a student or, or a teacher there. Okay. So I studied with Jose Gurria on drums and um, Brian Carmody, uh, my first two years. And then the second two years, I got saxophone lessons, but I was still playing drums in the ensemble. Nice. So I, I studied with Alex Kokuchi and Michael Seja, who, it's funny because these guys are like, you know, they're not much older than me now, but like, so we're all like kind of the same age, but like, um, it was just cool because we got like, the kids who were like maybe on scholarship or like who, who wanted to participate in the program gave private lessons. And, yeah. and that was huge for me too, you know, studying. Like I had lessons with them. I had lessons also, I studied with Rusty Higgins in Long Beach um, in high school for a few years. So he like, I was getting on him with clarinet, and flute, and saxophone also. So I, I had like a, quite a bit of private teaching, you know. Cool. So, um, so now, now that you mentioned like flute and all these other instruments, you know, when, when, when somebody starts on saxophone, for example, you know, almost always you see like they start with the alto saxophone, right? Yeah. The kids, whatever. How hard is it to like start adding the saxophones, like start adding like the tenor sax and, or the soprano sax and then, and then maybe the berry sax or maybe the flute. You, know, you see a lot of sax players playing flute. I was always like super interested in playing as many things as I, I can. I mean, you know, I've been really like playing bass a lot more recently. N not anywhere, just in my house, you know, and like practicing and getting down bass lines that I think are cool and this and that, you know. But always I've had the, just the fascination for me for like, you know, wanting to play everything I possibly can. You know, in an educational setting or something like that, like it's totally, it's not hard to like add the other saxophones, you know. Um, I mean, all the fingers are the same. It's just different embouchure, slightly different embouchure. And then getting access to them, you know, a lot of kids are not able to get a soprano or get a berry, you know, or whatever. Like, you what know? about the flute? The flute that, that's like a total different instrument, but it yeah. seems like so natural for you guys. Like, yeah, the fingerings are very almost the same. Uh, obviously, the embouchure is a lot different. And then, you know, the one big thing I think for me transitioning from saxophone to flute was the lack of pressure, the lack of uh, oh, okay. back pressure or like um, resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you know, like, you know, when you're in reeds, like very, you know, it's like, it's going somewhere and there's like pressure there. When you're flute, you're just like, 
you know, it's like, it, yeah, like yeah. oh man, I'm getting old. <laughs> so you just gotta learn how to find that resistance on flute and and, and to like be okay with that, you yeah. know, the, the amount of resistance that that. Awesome. But clarinet is, is another beast too, you know. I was just talking with a buddy of mine yesterday about clarinet and it's like, like during high school for like two or three years, I played in the concert band. It was funny, man, high school, I think, I had like seven periods in the day, right? Like seven different classes. And I think my senior year, I had like five band classes. Wow. <laughs> and like two normal classes. That's like a so, dream. Yeah, for, I was just for, always, always like, I was in like different ensembles, TAing and this class and music theory, AP music theory and all this and that. So I was in concert band for two years, I think two years it was that I played clarinet. You know, I was in an outreach band um, at Cerritos College. I was in their college band, you know, in high school. And I would play flute and clarinet there too, you know, because oh, it was nice. a big band. And yeah. Yeah, college yeah. kids so I had to like double and like be on that level you that's know? cool I only auditioned for like two schools you know um, Cal State Northridge and ASU Arizona State University and I, I don't really remember the reason why I think it was like I was like oh I don't I didn't get like super crazy grades so I don't think I can go anywhere and like not pay for it crazy amounts of money and like I, I loved like I heard a lot of cool things about season and I loved the fact, like I, I was gonna go to, Long, I was considering Long Beach, but at the time, I don't know if it's any different, but like you had to do two years of class school before you can even do the jazz program. Oh. So that's what turned me off about that. And I knew I wanted to stay, or like, I mean, I didn't mind traveling and going somewhere else, but um, I think my band teacher recommended ASU or said, yeah, I know the drum teacher there, he's really good. His name was Dom Moyo, I believe. Okay. Jump teacher over there. So I auditioned over there. Wait, I, so you auditioned uh, for drums? I, well, I auditioned at CSUN and ASU on drums and saxophone. Oh, uh, both. And uh, and at Arizona State, I would have gotten a full ride there on drums. You know, I, I had that on the thing. And then at CSUN, kind of the same thing. Like, Gary was like, yeah, I mean, like, what do you want to pursue more? Do you want to do saxophone or do you want to do drums? Like, you know, I like you and I like what you bring, whatever, blah, blah. We'd love to have you here. I always felt like right when I picked up saxophone that I could kind of express myself. Like that was my voice, you know, like I could really put a lot of emotion into that rather than on drums. I mean, there's an element of that, but there's an element too, like on saxophone where it's like a human voice, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I was never a good singer. I only have a very pleasant voice. So <laughs> I can I can do it on saxophone, you know? But, um, but yeah, the guy at ASU, I mean, I really am thankful for him too because he, uh, he gave me a call one day, the director of the jazz program and was like, hey man, like, you know, really like what you do, blah, blah. But, um, you know, I know you're doing your thing out there. You're playing in bands already yeah. in, in LA. And like, you know, just to be honest here, it's not like that. You know, there's no scene. It's not, don't expect it to be like gigging all the time like that over there in, in Arizona State. I think it was like Chandler or Flax. I, I forget where that campus yeah, yeah. was at. And he's like, you know, um, if you want to like master your craft and, and, you know, hone in on your musicianship and all this, this would be the perfect spot for you. You know, we'd love to have you and be great. What do you do? Well, when he told me that, I was like, okay. So I talked to Gary Pratt at CISA and he's like, he has a good point. So, you know, that's when I was like, okay, like for sure CSUN it is like, yeah. uh, I would love to go there. And um, man, and I loved going to CSUN. I mean, I, I, I can't stress that enough. Like people are always like, oh yeah, music college, it's a waste of time, this and that, and you know. I mean, for some people it can be. For me, I think it was important for me to like, like I had already grown up with all this kind of like natural born, like ability to like understand like harmony and, and be able to pick up melodies really quick and this and that, you know. But I like, I was lacking in theory and you know, the ability to sight read really well mm -hmm. and the ability to write charts clean and nice and you know. So I think college super helped me out with that, you know. Yeah. And to really understand like jazz language because I remember even like the first year or two like for my lessons, like my teacher's name was Rob Lockhart. Amazing saxophone player, I mean, ridiculous. And um, like he, he had like two degrees in jazz theory and just like all the things you were telling me, I'm like, okay, like what? Like, uh, so you know, struggling, super you know, fast and like, yo, slow down. Yeah, yeah. And wow, so, like, cool. I finally got it after some time, and I really was like, okay, yeah, like, now it all yeah, makes yeah. sense. Like, I'm, I'm able to understand it. Um, and it taught me a lot, man. Like, musicianship class with Gary Pratt. This was like the last year, two years that we took this class with him, able to, like, just really, like, develop our ear yeah. at, a, at a very high level. That, that's know? cool, too, like, you mentioned that, that you mentioned that, because uh, there's, there's a lot of musicians that. They they feel like 
they can just get by by what they know, like playing by ear or whatever. They ask themselves that, that question, like, why would I spend money and go to college to learn music if I can already play yeah. by ear? But it's just like, it opens another whole set of skills that exactly. you didn't have, like music theory, just being able to show up anywhere that you're called to and just like, yep. you know, play and rehearse and just sight read and all that. Yep. And <clears> be able <throat> to write charts, you know? <clears throat> I mean, it's more money for you, you know? Like, you're yeah. when you have the ability to do more things, you can arrange stuff, you can transcribe horns, I can write down arrangements. It just opens up, you know, the possibilities to more opportunities. Definitely. When you were in college, like, were you playing with artists? Like, what was your experience, like, professionally? It's so funny, man, because cause I was, you know, all throughout college, I was playing and, you know, for, you know, I was gigging and making money, blah, blah, like, it was cool. Um, but I was always just worried about it because everyone was always so, like, you know, oh, uh, making as a musician, blah, blah, you know. And, and I was always wanting to be, like, comfortable. I wanted to, like, you know, like, that was always on my mind, you know, as much as people said, like, man, just, you know, it'll work itself out type of thing. I was like, well, what if it doesn't? Am I just yeah. going to be like, homeless or something? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I was always worried about that. So, like, I was, like, talking with Gary, and I'd be like, you know, should I get a teaching degree? And he's like, do you? want to teach and I said no <laughs> he's like then don't do it like you're not gonna have fun you're not gonna like it so so I was like okay well that's out of question and I was like thinking okay I can go to the military band and he's like you gonna like that too like and I was like I don't know and he's like Fabian like just trust yourself that like you're gonna be fine you know like type of thing like again they set you up like in college you know like just being responsible and learning wearing the right clothes learning the music being on time showing interest in the gig like you, you know like all that stuff's very it's like very basic yeah but that's like the stuff that gets you called back always stressing that to me is like to younger players and people asking me for any advice is always like do you like what you gotta do like do the basics just, yeah. yeah and it's like you'll be good like if you're great to work with fun to work with you put time on your instrument you've done that like you know, every, you know things will work out you know one way or another i was super interested in coffee i mean like a nerd about coffee like i would go with my cousins kunal owns this you know that, that shop um and we'd like measure tds you know we had like uh in the coffee and we roast our own beans and we'd like have spreadsheets you know we were just total nerds about it that's what i did <laughs> on my free time a lot of time and i was actually gonna i had a business partner and we were like doing all these advances we were like collecting like we were getting equipment we were like meeting with realtors for you know locations and we were like doing all these things like preparing so much to open up a coffee shop um me and him and i had turned down a tour so there's this band called blind dog smoking they wanted me to tour with them when I was 15 years old. Wow. <laughs> I was like, uh, I gotta finish high school. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, they, they would always check in with me every year, like, hey, can you do blah, blah, you know? So like, when I graduated college, and they're like, okay, you know, that's what you wanna do. And then so I was like, let me just try this coffee thing. Like, just like, let me give it like a year, you know? Like, I just wanna see, you know, cause I, I was so interested in it. And I love doing music, obviously, like that was my passion, that's what I did in life. But I, but I was super interested in coffee as well, you know? So I was like, okay, um, so I turned him down and then like a few days after I turned him down a uh, business partner calls up and is like yo give them a call back right now and I was like why what's up he's like it's not gonna happen man like everything fell through because we got like our, our investors on our financial backing just, just oh, fell through. Man. so I was like are you serious he's like yeah man so I called him back and I was like dude I know you probably find some, found somebody else but uh even just think just if you can think for the future and he's like oh I haven't even told them that you couldn't do it so yeah you're good oh and, you did and, and, and we did um yeah so I went on tour with him like three or four weeks later and you know it was an amazing time dude it was crazy it was crazy it was the first tour that i'd done um we did 72 cities in 83 days wow <laughs> it was nuts wow it was crazy um how was the experience of touring like your first experience you know like yeah so we had we had a tour bus we were fortunate to have a tour bus huh? we had that but we didn't have a crew necessarily we had like people that were maybe like 100 people that were like there um, so you had to help so something we had to else. do everything man we had to set up our own stuff we had to you know tear down our own stuff yeah. like you know and some of the gigs were at like theaters and cool festivals yeah, some more had to bars merch it was everything man you know we all had to do everything and so like i said some some were nice venues some were like really bad venues where like nobody was there you wow. know um so it was just it was all over the map wow. so a ton of work but i had a blast i played congas timbales and 
and saxophone. It was such a cool experience, and, I, and I've been playing with them ever since, you know. My one, like, cool gig that I was like, wow, this is, uh, when I played with Lauren Hill, okay. um, I played with her at this uh, cannabis cup in, in Sacramento. <laughs> and, uh, I got called the night before, literally at 10 p.m. I was watching Avengers, I remember, and she hit, the, you know, the guy hit me up during the movie, and I was like, I'm on a flight right now, um, you know, so-and-so gave me your number, can you, can you be on a flight tomorrow at 7.30 a.m.? And I was like, what? For long? Yeah, yeah, I can do it, you know, I'm all like freaking out, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and he's like, all right, I'm gonna send you a file right now, it is the show. And it was a 90 minute clip, and there were no charts. Wow. And I was like, okay, cool, where are the charts at? And he's like, there's no charts, just on oh, the show. Oh my and I was god. Like, so I, I was like, it's 10.30 at night, 11 at night, whatever, you know, and I'm like, I'm not even paying attention to the movie at this point. My mind's just like, oh my gosh, like, what, okay. Okay, I got, I'm gonna play in front of all these people, with Lauryn Hill, and with I'm, no I'm charts. Myself, with no charts. What do you do, you try to grab everything at night? I or just what? listened to it like crazy, yeah, I made notes, and, and, um, and, I, and I just listened to it, listened to it, listened to it, listened to it, I got there, you know, me and the trumpet player ran through, and he was like, yeah, I think you're good, bro, like, we'll be good, we'll be good. Awesome. So we, um, you know, we did the show and it was great, man. It, um, you know, it was super fun. Everybody was cool. My experience, I always tell people, is like she was like joking around and laughing with us. She knew that I was obviously new and that I just, you know, heard about this like the night before. It was like super last minute. Nice. And so, you know, she she was awesome. Like she was great. But yeah, I mean, other than that, like I, I'm super happy to have been on uh, Mac Miller's last record. Nice. Um, that was cool. I did, I did some recording for that. This guy named Jake Miller, who's a, like an up and coming pop guy, did, yeah. did a thing on his record. So tell me, a, tell me a little bit about about um, about a trip you took to Dubai, and you stayed there for a little while. Yeah, that was awesome, man. So I went with this artist named Shalea, Shalea Fraser. Um, she's one of the best singers I've ever heard, much less played with ever. She's um, an amazing person too. So we did, um, Quincy Jones had recently opened up his own jazz club uh, at the Palazzo Versace in Dubai, which is like the Versace Hotel basically. Um, so yeah, we were like the second band to do a residency there and we stayed there for two months. Nice. And uh, so yeah, I played drums and sax. I played like, the first set I played like a few songs on sax, you know, with her. And then yeah, the rest was drums. But yeah, I mean, it was it was a amazing experience, man. The the ho the hotel, like it sounds, everything from head to toe was Versace. You know, the lobby was just a work of art. I mean, what's your, what's your experience uh, playing in a residency, uh, like a tour? You know, you go around and you're playing the same show over and over, right? The same songs. Yeah. Maybe there is a change on the list. Maybe like a song, a song gets cut or whatever, but. It's basically the same thing over and over, right? Yeah. How do you make it not boring? Or how do you not let it get boring for you? Yeah, I, for me, like, I'm, I'm so very gracious, man, that like, you know, I get to do music full time. And I'm genuinely, like, very thankful and very happy every time I get to play music. And, you know, I'm making money. Or even just in general, if I'm not making money, just making music as my job yeah. is like the best thing in the world. So like, it doesn't really get boring for me. Like those types of things, like, even though we're playing the same songs at night, whatever, every night, the songs is just like a, they're just like a gateway. You know, they're just like a, it's like, so someone said this, they're like, I don't like playing the same songs in front of a staff, you know, at a re like say you have a residency at a hotel and like, I'm like they're singing the same songs every day. And it's like, well, they're pouring the same drinks every day too. You know, they're pouring the same thing. Yeah, day. right. So it's like, oh, well, cool. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just how the experience is, you know, like you can have a good customer you can have a bad customer, you can have someone who's like you'll remember for your lifetime. Yeah. And some you just you Yeah, know. I think I think each time you play it's just different. Even yeah. if it's the same song, like Even, yeah, and the people make it different too, like the the crowd. Definitely. Sometimes like people are just like quiet. Yeah. And, and sometimes people are just like fired up, you know? And yeah. And even even playing like the really mundane stuff, like you know, happy on a, on a like on a wedding gig, or playing yeah. like you know all those all that repertoire, you yeah. know, like people can get really down about that stuff too. But yeah, I see that even as an amazing experience to be able to do that too. And how do you see gigs that pay X amount of money versus other gigs that pay maybe like little money or even like nothing? How do you approach that? I don't know who told me that, but there's like this rule of, of there's like a three. Thing Things, right it's like you gotta have two of these three things to, to like to do the gig right the money's right the money's really good the hang is really good 
and your friend, like and your own and your friends. And the third one will be that it's good for your career. So like, let's say you know nobody on the gig, but it's gonna be really good for your career to do that, and like the pay's really well, then cool, do it. Or if like th there's no pay or it's like whack pay, but you're with your friends and you know it'll be good for everybody's career and like you know like you gotta have two of those three things, right? So I mean, not that I approach every gig like that, like well uh, this one's not gonna be good for my career and yeah. this, so I'm not gonna do it. You that's, know, it's that's, just, a good, that's an awesome way to see it. Yeah, I believe that sometimes you need to sacrifice. It's just like do Absolutely. do everything so you know so people can see you. Yep. Because most of the times like people don't listen to us. Yeah. They just listen to what we do on our instrument. We play. That's that's how I like to see it. I like to like talk with my instrument. Something I'll never forget my entire life. Like biggest compliments from, from that, that one gig. You know, there was this lady. She was like eighty something years old. Like super old, frail lady. She said, "Young man, you know I've had one of the worst weeks in my entire life. I mean, seriously, it's been terrible. She was listening to you play today." brought me so much joy and, and, and it made me forget about all that bad stuff that happened, even just for a little bit. That's and so I was awesome. like, I wanted to cry, you know, because yeah, I was just yeah. like, you know, I don't know this person, yeah. they don't know me, but like just what I did with my music allowed her to escape for a little bit. Yeah, you know? that's, man, the power of music is just like crazy. At the same time, we need to know and learn how to be our own negotiators, because yeah. that's one thing that they don't they don't show you that in, in, in school, like, yeah. and that's the main thing that, you, that we go through, like, and we learn on the streets, like, to like hustle and like negotiate for ourselves. The business part of it is, is just not, most of the times, not good for us musicians yeah you know it's good for some people but not good for the musicians how do you approach that that part yeah so with those situations i mean you know sometimes there's you know there's something you can do like hey man like i got something else this day and like, i'd love to play with you but this is what it is and they're like oh okay well let me like i really want you on the gig man so let me let me throw you yeah. make up the difference yeah you know or whatever like sometimes that'll happen or you know if it's like a setting where it's like your own group where you're like somebody's asking you personally like like i want Fabian Chavez there you know or i want omar there like you know what is it gonna take to get omar there you know and then you say well this is what i what i think i'm worth like as far as my playing and and what everything i do this is what it is you know and and then you know at that point it's on you but you have to know like you have to a be able to like bring that game every time you know you have to bring that if you're gonna charge them a good amount or a big amount for your product or your branding your brand you you have to be able to deliver and, yeah. and and show that okay this guy is really he's worth it you know that's how it is with us you know that you offer this one thing i know that i offer this one thing that's like well you know you can call it dudes but they're not gonna offer what i offer or not not, not yeah. the same way you know and different gigs pay different amounts so we know that there's like big gigs or it's like small gigs when we talk about size not about the music but like a big size venue or like a small size venue or like you're doing a recording and requires you to like play tenor sax alto sax and very very sax it's not yeah. the same as just like oh you know you're just gonna play alto sax you know so um tell me about some projects you're working on or you're about to work on you know you have music of your own i do um I haven't released too much music on my own. I have one single out that you can find on iTunes and Spotify. It's called Train Mania. And that's like, a, it's like a straight ahead, like super Coltrane inspired, just like heavy swinger, you know? Cool, I'll link it below and so people yeah, can Yeah, yeah, link to that. It. And then there's another project that, you know, called FM Project. Okay. Um, and so that's with my buddy Michael Raganese as well. All right. And it's like a sax and keys duo and, um, you check out our Instagram, we got some cool videos on Instagram, and you know, we're gonna be releasing some music, hopefully soon. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for, for having me here, man, no. and thank you for, for the interview. Yeah, I just uh, wish you the best, man, with your career and everything. I know we're gonna be thank you. playing together a lot. Yes, sir. Now that I'm here in the LA area, hey. in your town. Uh, and thank you, thank you guys for watching uh, on YouTube, Musicians Talk Music, or any of the podcast platforms. You can just go and, and check out Musicians Talk Music, it's available. Check out the episodes. We're going to have new episodes every Friday. So I'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Hey.